This, this story is the greatest conspiracy of silence. Something terrible happened here, and for decades, no one talked about it. Honestly, that's a lot of missing people, people that probably had families. Whereas the media likes to focus on the massacre that happened in Tulsa in 1921, a government-assisted destruction that they call a riot, as if there were two sides to this argument, there is a deeper truth that is seldom talked about. There were a dozen surgeons and doctors. There were several lawyers. And it is the fact that within the borders of America lied the answer to racism itself. The ultimate counterpoint to those would claim that the black man isn't at the same measure of a man than the white man. About 40 to 45 blocks of a residential community with a business district. And that proof by demonstration, that proof made by recently freed black men in an environment that is all in all hostile to them. That proof was so elegant, so rich, so upwardly, that the white men destroyed it with the assistance of the U.S. government who used planes to bomb its own citizens just so that those with less melanin could continue to proclaim that the black man is poor because he cannot build a thriving community or grandiose civilization. And yet, in this northeastern Oklahoma town was that very answer they were looking for. But behind the rising black smoke of the destruction of the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma, we can see a town that was created by blacks, flourished, and a few decades after the Civil War became so rich that it started to employ their previous owners. And that truth was repeated in multiple early 20th century black-built communities. All of them would suffer the same fate. A fate we now see was a deliberate and premeditated approach to ensure that no successful community of color would see the day of light. It is in that same period, right after the Civil War, that we see the excellence of the black man in America. With Granville Woods and his incredible inventions from the multiplex telegraph, which allowed moving trains to communicate, with Madam C.J. Walker, the self-made millionaire who invented and sold hair products, with George Washington Carver, who has hundreds of agriculture-related inventions and foods to his name, the real McCoy, with Louis Latimer, who invented the incandescent light bulb, or Garrett Morgan, inventor of the traffic light, or Joseph H. Smith, who invented the sprinkler system. O.W. Gurley and J.B. Stratford, they worked together and they had a specific intent. Make African-Americans wealthy, landowners, entrepreneurs. At the turn of 1921, the city was divided into the rich district and the poor district where most of the recently freed black population had been gathering. The Greenwood District was considered one of the most affluent African-American communities in the country. Black business interest succeeded in dividing itself of any sort of white structure. It is interesting that within this hostile environment, where the black man was relegated to its lowest participation in the economic structures of America, it is interesting that it is in this precise environment that the black man thrived, in a self-constructed economic system, land was bought and sold exclusively within the blood community. The wealth generated in Greenwood was significant. Estimates suggest that the dollar circulated 36 to 100 times within the community before leaving it, and some reports indicate that money would stay within Greenwood for nearly a year before being spent elsewhere. This internal circulation of wealth led to an impressive accumulation of capital. In fact, per capita income in Greenwood exceeded that of much of white America at the time. Not that too different from that of many Asian, American, or Jewish American communities today. Greenwood was a community of necessity. It was a segregated enclave. Uh, black folks couldn't apply their trades or purchase goods and services in the larger white community, so they created their own economy. That economy became successful because black folks did business with one another. The community's total wealth, 
was estimated to be in the $17 million. This would be equivalent to $21.4 billion today. An astonishing number considering the fact that decades prior African Americans were forced servants in the region. All kinds of businesses were generated exclusively within a racial enclave. There was no expectation of funding coming from the government in order to build infrastructure or protect its citizens. There was a clear understanding that nothing was to be expected from a hostile power structure. Again, not too similar from Asian, American, or Jewish American societies. The same pattern is reflected in the hundreds of African civilizations, historical African civilizations, without any white involvement. To such an extent that it is difficult for those who have been conditioned to believe in the impossibility of black excellence to even accept, let alone recognize that, from the inventors of agriculture to the builders of Gobekli Tepe, to the early Sumerians, to the builders of the pyramid, to the inventors of writing mathematics, algebra, medicine, philosophy, it is difficult for them to accept that all these came from the black man and thrived in black created societies. The success of Greenwood can be attributed to the entrepreneurial spirit and determination of its residents. For instance, O. W. Gurley, a wealthy black landowner from Arkansas, purchased 40 acres of land in Tulsa and began to develop the area that would become Greenwood. He built boarding houses, a grocery store, and other businesses, encouraging other black entrepreneurs to invest in the district. One notable figure was Dr. A. C. Jackson, a renowned black surgeon considered one of the most skilled in the nation. His practice in Greenwood attracted patients from across the country, and he became a symbol of black excellence in the medical field. Another prominent resident was Simon Barry, who owned a bus service and the first black-owned taxi service in the United States. Barry's enterprises provided essential transportation services within Greenwood and to other parts of Tulsa. In fact, the common thread here, that veritas that will seldom be spoken aloud, is that history ironically holds within itself the answers that all the bigots have been asking. In an elegant proof by contradiction, a proof lidden with irony, history shows us that if any race of man holds the rights to bigotry and has a claim to superiority, it is that very race that happens to be the most accepting of all, accepting to a fault, accepting to such an extent that it inventions of writing and religion were spread out throughout the world and he has the receipt to show it. From the undeniable black statues in Asia of Buddha, repainted white and over centuries of colonialism, to the undeniable statues of the mother culture in Mesoamerica, so black in fact that their dreadlocks head coverings are only worn in one other place in human civilization, and that is, in West Africa. So black in fact, that ancestors of those today who claimed some form of superiority, the same ancestors clearly spoke of the identities of those who they learned from. The fact, conveniently forgotten and upended into a celebration of a Greek miracle, where supposedly philosophy and science emerged out of nowhere. And yet from Solomon to Pythagoras, they all admitted to the source of their writings and knowledge. That same industry which left on its own demise does not fault and does not fail, but produces excellence when it is not tempered with. Excellence in Tulsa, Oklahoma, excellence in medieval Africa, and excellence in the very beginnings of human history itself. It is this truth that will not be spoken out loud, because to show even one of these receipts is to debunk the whole Athenian temple of lies erected in the pantheon of immorality for the sole purpose of the short-sighted economic benefit that is precipitating a whole planet into an accelerated doom covered by a mushroom cloud of hate. A lot of these riots are really fueled by anxieties about black advancement and black success. And we're not only talking about cities like Chicago or DC or New York, we're talking about cities like Tulsa. Hundreds of businesses essentially debunked white notions of black inadequacy or mental incapability which had fueled for centuries the economic basement of an immoral treatment of its fellow man could not stand if Tulsa continued to expand. And these lies would not stand especially if more and more black owned businesses were becoming more successful than their white counterpart across the other side of the town and more successful than most businesses in the country at large. White Tulsans 
had to stand by and watch while African Americans met, and more often than not, exceeded the standard of living. You can imagine the effect on the psyche of those who had lived their whole lives, being told that black people could not and did not have the capacity to outclass them. And many within that group were previous owners of agrarian fields where they had forced many to work. And they had masked the immorality of their way of living by accepting the nighttime story that convinced them black people weren't really people. In 1921, those same tensions in the United States were present in Tulsa. And it did revolve around jealousy and resentment. It threatened the system of white supremacy. Trail of Tears removed native landowners 4,500 miles towards the native relocation zone. Many of the native leaders had become wealthy before taking the forced march and they owned black forced servants. Many of these native bound forced servants would become essential in the formation of Black Wall Street. The relocated natives from the Trail of Tears were perhaps the true founders of the town of Tulsa, Oklahoma, before the white population arrived in waves at the end of the 19th century. Edward McCobb, a very rich businessman from Oklahoma, was amongst the influential black figures that enticed the black population to settle in Tulsa in the hopes of creating a new haven for themselves. A politician and businessman, he was born in Troy, New York. He made his mark as an attorney and a speculator. His investment background helped him realize that Tulsa would be an adequate location where blacks could thrive economically, free from any still hostile white influence. He arrived a decade before the turn of the century and established the Langston City Herald. This smaller enterprise really served as a model for what would eventually become the Greenwood District. He used his advertisement in the Herald to announce Greenwood as an advanced and wealthy dominion where blacks with any skills could thrive and raise their family. He added the following to his advertisements to great effect, quote, here the Negro can rest from mob law here he can be secure of Southern policies. By 1891, those advertisements and pamphlets had done their part. 200 black residents were already living in Langston, and they included doctors, a minister, and a school teacher. Soon after, there was a veritable race for African Americans to arrive in Tulsa to purchase land. By the start of the 1910s, McCabe had purchased 300 acres of land and had almost single-handedly established the basis of the Greenwood District himself. His dream was quickly taking shape when the state voted in Jim Crow statues. He spent his last bit of fortune fighting the Jim Crow laws, but the Supreme Court upheld the segregated laws. Now out of money and defeated by the Supreme Court decision, McCabe died in 1920. Although the Ku Klux Klan had been banned from operation four years after the war, they continued to operate underground. This were in fact a reflection of the frustration of the Southern whites who had lost their forced labor, which constituted the brunt of the workforce, causing many white to have to work hard in order to make a living, even in an environment that was favorable to them. So to have a number of economically thriving black communities majority of them, made of recently freed servants, caused many white to seek shelter under the comfort of white supremacy sold by the KKK. How could so many black communities be thriving? Communities made of those who started with nothing and were now beacons where many southern whites themselves were forced to look for a job. Back in the Greenwood district, the investment made by McCabe had now turned the black Tulsa population into a growing economic power center. And the discovery of oil in Tulsa further propelled the status of the black population living there. Many of the black oil barons were black. Entrepreneurs like Jake S. Jr., who became one of the leading executives in the oil industry. Tulsa outrage was the culmination of the fear against blacks in Tulsa before the riots. A district judge sentenced 17 African Americans who were taken by mobs 
bound, tortured, before they were set on fire. So the hatred had been institutionalized well before the massacre started. The entrepreneurial spirit in Greenwood was further exemplified by individuals like J.B. Stratford, who owned the largest black-owned hotel in the United States at the time, the Stratford Hotel. With 54 rooms, the hotel was a symbol of luxury and a testament to the community's wealth. Stratford was also a lawyer and advocated for black rights and economic independence. Another notable entrepreneur was A.J. Smitherman, the founder and editor of the Tulsa Star newspaper. Smitherman used his platform to promote civil rights and encourage the community to support black-owned businesses. His work helped to unify Greenwood's residents and amplify their successes. Cultural life in Greenwood was vibrant. Jazz and blues music flourished, with local musicians performing in clubs and venues throughout the district. The area attracted entertainers from across the country, enhancing its reputation as a cultural hub. The success of Black Wall Street did not go unnoticed. Booker T. Washington visited Greenwood and was so impressed by its prosperity that he referred to it as Negro Wall Street. The district's accomplishments were celebrated in black newspapers and publications nationwide that the story of Tulsa was allowed to resurface. But what those with ill intent have forgotten is that that same resolve that built Black Wall Street built the pyramids and wrote the epic of Gilgamesh. That same drive still burns strong in those who are said to be without history, but have ironically birthed civilization itself. That resolve is now the fuel that powers the heart of an army of young girls and young men, all of them ready to be born anew. Without history cannot exist without the support of many of you. From sharing the video to your Patreon and YouTube memberships. These help me continue to bring our truth. The missing piece in the history of man. Don't miss our previous episode where we cover the evidence of the influential black nobility in medieval Europe.
Join us and see how those who are said to be without history birthed civilization itself.